Tonight, a Thunder Bay judge finds Braden Bushby guilty of manslaughter in the death of Barbara Kentner. After the last shot, um, it, it just hit me. Like, as a Mi'kmaq community member here, we're never going to be accepted. And that's how I feel. A Mi'kmaq lobster fisher is shot at when checking his traps. We know that the Pfizer vaccine is very fragile, requiring minus 70 degrees Celsius um, refrigeration. And the COVID-19 vaccine rolls into Canada. Good evening, I'm Brittany Hobson. We begin tonight in Thunder Bay, where Braden Bushby has been found guilty of manslaughter in the death of 34-year-old Anishinaabekwe Barbara Kentner. Kentner died in July 2017, five months after Bushby threw a trailer hitch at her from a moving vehicle. For more, we're joined by the Globe and Mail's Willow Fiddler from Thunder Bay. Thanks for joining us today, Willow. What was the reaction to today's guilty verdict? There was, you know, a lot of um, hugging and tears outside of the courtroom today, but it's, um, you know, it's pretty clear that this is just a small uh, piece of justice um, for the Kentner family and um, Indigenous communities in this region. What did the judge have to say leading up to the guilty verdict? So there was, you know, a few different things with this case. It was really about, um, you know, there was no disputing that Braden Bushby threw the trailer hitch um, that hit Barbara Kettner in the stomach, you know, causing her small intestine to rupture. And six months later, she died. What the Crown had to prove that is that, um, you know, he knew by throwing that trailer hitch, it was going to cause uh, damage, that, that, that it would hurt somebody. And um, so the justice, uh, you know, had said she was satisfied that the Crown was able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and she, you know, used the uh, testimony and the evidence from the forensic pathologist who listed Barbara's cause of death as, um, there, there was actually three different things that were listed there. One was a, a pneumonia, uh, a second was a peritonitis, which is some sort of infection. Um, but, but ultimately she, she said, you know, none of that would have happened and, and if she hadn't been injured by that trailer hitch. So, um, you know, the, ju the justice was, was satisfied that, um, that that was the case and, and uh, yeah, that was part of the verdict. Is Braden Bushby now in custody, and when can we expect sentencing to take place? Braden Bushby remains out on custody on conditions. Um, he's spent very little time in jail since all of this has happened. Um, you know, part of his conditions is that he has to stay uh, with his surety, who is his uh, mother at this point, I believe. Um, and sentencing is now scheduled for February the 9th at which time the justice um, will take some time following uh, that hearing, which she says will uh, last probably a full day. She said she's gonna need some time to reflect uh, on, on that and before she comes back with, with a sentence for uh, Mr. Bushby. Well, thank you so much, Willow, for taking the time to sit down and chat with us. Thanks for having me, Brittany. And for more on the guilty verdict, we're joined by Alvin Fiddler, the Grand Chief of Nishnabi Aski Nation. Thanks for joining us tonight, Grand Chief Fiddler. Can you tell us what are your thoughts on the guilty verdict? Well, I think first of all, uh, I think we all need to just uh, take a moment to uh, remember uh, Barbara's uh, uh, family and community. Uh, I know that her sisters were in the courtroom today. So our thoughts and uh, our hearts uh, are with them uh, um, today as they received uh, uh, this news. There was a ceremony for Barbara Kentner's family today. Um, can you tell us what the reaction from the community was? Well, uh, you know, there's been uh, a number of things that, that have happened here over the last uh, week or so, including a uh, a sacred fire that was lit and a, a show of solidarity, uh, a gathering of people uh, with the community yesterday. And I think it's just to show uh, the family uh, and the community of uh, of Wabagoon that uh, uh, that all of us uh, stand with them. 
and that uh, we just wanted to show uh, that you know, to extend our friendship and our support uh, to them during this very difficult time. Now, you put out a statement saying many recent acts of violence are raising fear that Indigenous lives are held at lesser value and that victims are held responsible for their own death. Do you believe this will be a turning point? I hope so. I really, I really hope so that uh, uh, at least um, you know, to uh, send a message out there that uh, um, you know, if anyone in Thunder Bay or anywhere else for that matter uh, cause harm uh, to Indigenous uh, people, that uh, they will be held accountable. And I hope uh, with today's uh, ruling that uh, um, you know, that's the beginning of, uh, uh, you know, that the justice system uh, taking uh, uh, the lives of these people uh, uh, seriously and, and uh, that there will be consequences if, if you go out uh, to the streets, so whether it's here in Thunder Bay or Winnipeg or elsewhere, and uh, if you intend to cause harm uh, or serious uh, uh, harm or even death to uh, first states and people, that you're going to be able to... Uh, you're going to be held accountable for that. Now, the sentencing isn't taking place until uh, early next year. What are you hoping comes from that? Well, just just based on, uh, I, I didn't read all of the uh, uh, the whole ruling, uh, uh, all the all the uh, you know, the documents that were released today, but uh, just uh, glancing through uh, Justice Pierce's uh, uh, ruling today that. Uh, she spells it out, I think, very clearly that uh, that there was intent that when uh, Braden Bushby uh, went out uh, that evening and when uh, he took with him uh, this uh, trailer hitch, that uh, it was intentional, that was planned. Uh, and, uh, and I think today's ruling reflects that, and I'm sure the, the sentencing will will reflect uh, the ruling that we, uh, that we heard today. Okay, thanks for joining us, Granchi Fildler. Thank you for having me. In the Atlantic region, a moderate livelihood fishery in Pictou Landing, Nova Scotia, has not been met with violence seen in the south. Until this weekend, that is. That's when a Mi'kmaq lobster harvester was shot at when he went to check his traps. Angel Moore reports. A Mi'kmaq fisher of Pictou Landing First Nation went out on the water to confront the people stealing his lobster traps, and that was when he was shot at three times. Gary Denny says he is still in shock. After the last shot, um, it, it just hit me. Like, as a Mi'kmaq community member here, we're never going to be accepted, and that's how I feel. Denny said this is a whole new level of violence from non-Indigenous fishers. His traps have been cut since he has been fishing. Picto Landing is the fourth Mi'kmaq community to launch a moderate livelihood fishery following Eskazoni and Bolodek. Sabaganagati First Nation launched in southwestern Nova Scotia, which was met with violence from non-Indigenous fishers who say the moderate livelihood fishery is illegal. This is the first instance of firearms used. You know, we didn't think that anything like this would happen here and right on our street. The RCMP have confirmed four people have been arrested and the investigation is ongoing. Denny says he will continue to fish. Well, there's one thing that Sonyaville fishermen from Spagnagdi and PLFN have in common. We're not giving up. In the violent attacks against Sabaganagati lobster harvesters, 21 people have been arrested so far, related to the large mob that surrounded a lobster pound in southwestern Nova Scotia, trapping Mi'kmaq fishers inside. A few days later, the pound was burnt to the ground. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Picto Landing, First Nation. The first doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine arrived in Canada over the weekend. In a press conference today, government officials gave vague answers as to when Canada and First Nations can expect to be vaccinated. The vaccine touched down Saturday evening at various locations around the country. This is the first shipment of 30,000 doses. Canada says they will be receiving 249,000 doses by the end of the month. 
When asked for details on further shipments, Minister of Procurement Anita Anand said that is still being worked out. She also didn't know when remote Indigenous communities would get the vaccine. We know that the Pfizer vaccine is very fragile, requiring minus 70 degrees Celsius um, refrigeration or freezer temperatures. And so uh, we are hopeful that additional vaccines as they come online and are approved by Health Canada and that are able to be stored at less cold temperatures um, will be easier to transport to those communities. And by all means, we will be making sure that those communities have the refrigeration and freezer capacity necessary to ensure that vulnerable populations are indeed well served. History has been made today as the first Canadians have now been vaccinated. The first person in Canada, an 89-year-old woman from Quebec City living at a senior's home. This is Giselle Levesque getting the shot at around 11.30 Eastern this morning. She's a resident of the St. Anton long-term care home, the sort of facility that COVID-19 has ravaged the most. Madame Levesque is the first of 5,000 people in Quebec who officials expect will receive the vaccine in the next few days. Health Minister Patty Haidu says today marks a great step in Canada's fight against COVID-19 for Canada. It's really good news for Quebec. It's really good news for everybody across the country. But we also have to keep protecting each other. And uh, one worry I know I would share with Minister Dubé is that Canadians think that this is just around the corner that COVID-19 is over. This is going to help. It's a very strong tool. Madhu also says Canadians must be patient while they wait for more vaccines to arrive. The government of the Northwest Territories is calling it a turning point in the pandemic with a vaccination campaign like no other in history. On Friday, the NWT announced it will receive enough doses of Moderna's COVID-19 to vaccinate 75% of residents aged 18 and over within the first three months of 2021, with more doses to follow. Over 51,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine will be delivered to the NWT between January and March. The territory will gradually roll out more doses for any adult who wants a vaccine. But travel restrictions and self-isolation will stay in place until Canada has a whole sees lower cases and there's been widespread vaccination. NWT's chief medical officer says those at risk of severe disease and those at risk of bringing COVID-19 back into the territory will be a priority along with other factors. We'll also consider key populations recommended by the National Committee, Advisory Committee on Immunization. We will also listen to perspectives from Indigenous and community governments. Engagement is set to begin as soon as next week. Building trust and confidence across our territory will be vital to ensuring an equitable rollout. As some northern communities in Manitoba grapple with cases of COVID-19, One First Nation is doing its best to curb cases of the virus from entering the community as the holidays approach. Students from Pukatawagan have started to return home for the winter break, but not before they have to isolate in the community school. Frontline workers wanted to make it more comfortable so, for residents, so they created privacy tents for each person isolating, as well as set up the isolation center with festive decorations like this makeshift Christmas tree. Family and friends pop by for chats through the window. 29 students have gone through the isolation center. There are no active cases of COVID-19 in the community. Big news from our neighbours to the south. A major league sports team is changing their name. More on that after the break. Welcome back. News over the weekend is that Cleveland's baseball team is dropping its Indians nickname ending a 105-year-old tradition. An official announcement is expected later this week. Native Americans have been pressing for the name change for decades. 
Marionette Pember is a Native American national correspondent for Indian Country Today and a resident of the state of Ohio. She joins us now to talk about this development. Hi, Ms. Pember, thanks for joining us today. As a Native American living in Ohio, how do you feel that it looks like the Cleveland Indians are no more? Well, it's certainly uh, been a long time coming and uh, many of us have uh, looked forward to this day for a long time. Yes, certainly uh, a big news that was out this weekend. Um, the Washington football team finally dropped its racist nickname due to the threat of losing corporate sponsorships. Is this the same case in Cleveland? You know, um, I wonder if that didn't also, you know, uh, motivate them. I mean, for quite some time, uh, the Native community has uh, spoken to them about the usage of the, uh, the mascot, and it hasn't uh, really had too large of an impact on them. They did retire the uh, logo ch uh, Chief Wahoo a couple of years ago, but I think it was, uh, I'm sure um, money had something to do with it. Absolutely, you know, particularly in the climate we're in now, we're we're having some uh, racial reckoning. I imagine it did play a role, although I don't know firsthand about any corporate discussions that they had. Now uh, we've heard supporters say in the past that these types of nicknames honor Native Americans, but you've written that in the case of the Cle of Cleveland, this was not the case back in 1915. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, well, I don't think it's ever really been the case that it's been honoring Native Americans. It was honoring, if it was, it was honoring a, I will say it was a Native American who never was. Um, it's all really based on a, um, you know, really a, a, an imperialist view of history that really has very little to do with actual Native people here in the States. So, you know, often tied to, you know, these kind of social memes like, uh, you know, Wild Bill Hickok's Wild West show, which was kind of an amalgamation of Plains Indian styles of these people would ride in on horses with flags. And, you know, it, it's not something that I think as Native people we would, uh, um, most of us I don't feel really explicitly honored by these terms. Now, um, of course, the battle isn't over with these nicknames. There's still the NFL's Kansas City Chiefs, for example. What needs to be done next? You know, I think obviously we're, you know, uh, it, it, we're having kind of a tsunami, if you will, in the U.S. of racial reckoning. And um, these folks are being hit in the pocketbook. And uh, I think that that momentum just needs to continue. You know, that's no longer, we could, you know, we yelled and, you know, spoke out to them for years about uh, the inappropriateness of these names. But I think that we're seeing that the uh, culture at large is, uh, is questioning these folks and also they're, they're, they're um, using their monies, you know, they're to, uh, I think, have an influence. So I think it's being forced on them and, um, I think it will come slowly, but I think it will come. We are, of course, seeing a bit of this reckoning here in Canada as well, um, specifically with Edmonton's professional football team changing their name after many years of advocates calling for that. Do you foresee all these nicknames and mascots gone in the very near future? Gosh, you know, that's so difficult to predict. You know, I, I'm not actually a business writer, so I think that there are things at play that um, that I don't know about and probably the public at large doesn't know about. But I think there's a lot of pressure. I think they're experiencing far more pressure from the public at large than they ever have in the past. And um, I think it's difficult for them to resist. So one would hope that uh, the change would be made, so made soon for other teams as well. Okay. Well, thank you. That's um, all the time that we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. We want to hear what you think about the name change for Cleveland's MLB team. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Stick around, we have a preview of tomorrow's special In Focus episode on the five-year anniversary of the release of the TRC's Calls to Action.
Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. Looks like someone wants a job with Santa this year, thanks to Evelyn Bustelik for sharing this photo of a miniature pony all dressed up for the season. Be sure to send us your great pictures to share at aptn.ca and there could be a chance that your photo could be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Here's tomorrow's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Minus 8 in snow in Charlottetown. Minus 6 in Halifax. Minus 3 in Nain. Minus 7 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Some sun and minus 8 in Montreal. Minus 20 in Val d'Or. In southern Ontario, minus 15 in sun in North Bay. Minus 1 in Sarnia. 10 below in Thunder Bay, cloudy minus 16 in Sioux Lookout. In northern Manitoba, sunny skies and minus 24 in Puckatawagan. 20 below in Norway House. Minus 12 in Sun in Brandon. Minus 11 in Gimli. In Saskatchewan, some sun and clouds and minus 7 in Swift Current. 13 below in Regina. Minus 19 in Lorange. Snow and minus 18 in Buffalo Narrows. In northern Alberta, 16 below in snow in Fort McMurray and Peace River. Zero degrees in sun in Calgary, two above in Lethbridge. In the west coast, 10 degrees in Campbell River, two above in Kamloops. Minus one in Smithers, minus 15 with some sun in Dees Lake. In the Yukon, chilly minus 36 in Old Crow, minus 22 in Rock River. Over to the NWT, minus 32 in Sun in Norman Wells, minus 34 in Wati. 30 below in Colville Lake, minus 26 in Inuvik. In Nunavut, minus 30 in some Sun in Chesterfield, minus 26 in Whale Cove. 14 below in Iqaluit, minus 15 in Sun in Clyde River. Researchers are turning to our artificial intelligence to save endangered whales in BC. They're aiming to teach a computer to recognize killer whale sounds to help prevent ships from fatally striking endangered orcas. The system would send real-time alerts to ships to slow down or change course hours before the whales may be in their path. University researchers from Simon Fraser, Dalhousie and Carleton are among those working to develop the machine learning tools. We have a special in focus coming up for you tomorrow afternoon. Here's a look. Tuesday on a special in focus. It's been five years since the TRC delivered its final report and laid out 94 calls to action. What progress has been made and where have we fallen short? Former Chief Commissioner Murray Sinclair, former Commissioners Marie Wilson and Wilton Littlechild join host Melissa Ridgen live in studio for this important discussion. Share your comments via social media. In Focus, Tuesday. You can catch that special edition of APTN In Focus tomorrow at 1 p.m. Mountain, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's all your APTN national news for this Monday, December 14th. This is online at aptnnews.ca. I'm Brittany Hobson. Stay safe and have a great evening.